Um, but first up, uh, all really addressing themes to do with disease mechanisms and how do we get from these large-scale data sets to the, the final mile of understanding disease mechanisms and, and hopefully doing something about that in terms of uh, uh, therapeutic opportunities. So uh, first up, uh, Sake Catharacin, uh, listed here as the, uh, oh yes, not of the Broad anymore, but from Verb Therapeutics, and uh, welcome Sake. Okay, um, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to, to, to speak today. Um, I'd like to kind of frame today's uh, talk uh, around these two men. Um, what you uh, see on the left is Jim Fix. Uh, Jim is credited with uh, starting America's fitness revolution. He had a, a famous book um, in 1977 called The Complete Book of Running. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, while jogging in Vermont at the age of 52. Uh, so he had premature coronary artery disease. Uh, on the right um, is, of course, Churchill, who's really a a poster child for uh, bad health behaviors. Um, he always had a cigar in his mouth. He uh, drank um, uh, a lot and was obese. And, and there's actually a famous story. I think uh, he was visiting the king of Saudi Arabia and was told that um, in the king's presence due to his religion, uh, there was no smoking or alcohol consumption allowed. And then um, Churchill responded that uh, something to the effect, my rule of life prescribed um, as an absolutely sacred right uh, smoking, cigars, and also the drinking of alcohol before, after, and if need be, during all meals and in the intervals between them. Uh, and so he was actually allowed to uh, continue in, in, uh, with his uh, drinking and smoking. And despite a lifetime of that, uh, he actually uh, lived to a very uh, old age, 90, uh, before succumbing to cardiovascular disease. So these two men, I think, highlight two concepts that we uh, kind of think about all the time, which is risk and resistance. So on the left, uh, for Fizz, uh, uh, Jim Fix, um, why do some people get disease at an early age? On the right, uh, for Churchill, uh, are there pathways that confer uh, protection from disease, resistance to disease? And these are the two uh, frames I'd like to, um, to kind of anchor our discussion in. And specifically around a, a disease that I've worked on, uh, a heart attack or myocardial infarction, um, so if you think about risk and resistance factors, um, these could be encoded in the genome. And so you have the average um, individual, average genome, average risk for MI. Some individuals may have uh, a specific mutation that either increases risk or, in some cases, uh, is the basis for resistance. So let's look at these two uh, questions and what we've uh, kind of figured out over the last 10 plus years. So to look at risk for myocardial infarction, we began um, uh, in 1997 enrolling patients at Mass General Hospital with uh, myocardial infarction at a young age, a heart attack at a young age. And we chose uh, individuals with men less than 50, women less than 60, because uh, myocardial infarction is more heritable, um, has a larger genetic component when it happens at an early age. And so um, what uh, we've been able to uh, elucidate is there are basically three major uh, genetic paths to MI. Uh, there's the monogenic model, uh, single mutation sufficient to lead to early disease, the polygenic model, the additive effect of uh, many variants, and then the most recent observation relates to somatic mutations. So these are um, uh, uh, acquired mutations uh, in, during one's own lifetime that could potentially confer a role for coronary artery disease. So um, we uh, just going to give you the results in kind of a, a, in a summary form. Uh, we looked at a se several thousand individuals who had MI before the age of uh, 50 for men and 60 for women and uh, had access to whole genome sequence data in, in all these individuals. And it turns out roughly, if you have 100 patients like this, 2% you can find uh, a mutation in one of uh, several uh, uh, cholesterol-raising genes um, that lead to uh, early disease. And the risk confers roughly around fourfold in carriers compared to non-carriers. And the mechanism of these monogenic mutations um, really is just raised cholesterol shown on the top left here or uh, triacylglycerol triglycerides on the, shown on the bottom left. And here's a, a graph in that study uh, of uh, individuals who don't have the mutation and those who do, and you can see that there's about uh, an 80 milli milligram deciliter, about two millimoles higher uh, LDL in individuals who carry monogenic mutation versus not. 
In addition to the monogenic model, um, uh, recently uh, it's become clear that the polygenic model plays an important role. And so here um, we, we can capture the risk conferred by common variants across the genome, roughly uh, a little, little, about 6.6 .6 million variants. Distill that risk into a single number, uh, and that number has a, a bell curve, uh, uh, bell shaped distribution in the population, a Gaussian distribution, and that's shown here. And some individuals are high, some low. Um, and the question became uh, how much higher risk are those who are in the tail of this new risk factor? Um, and it turned out that uh, you could find about 17% of the individuals with early MI, their predominant um, abnormality is being on the one end of the bell curve of this risk factor, of this, this polygenic score. And the risk um, uh, uh, estimate uh, based on being, uh, having a high polygenic score was roughly the same as that conferred by the monogenic uh, risk mutations in LDL receptor, APOB, or PCSK9 genes. Um, and so uh, the important point, I think, about this uh, polygenic uh, score is that individuals who are uh, high on the scores are currently unaware of their risk. There's no other biomarker that actually tracks with this risk, unlike, for example, cholesterol, which tracks with the monogenic mutation. So, um, and so this, I think, you know, gives us a potential prevention opportunity, which I'll try to highlight in a, in a couple of minutes. So how are these individuals getting to higher risk? Uh, is it cholesterol? Um, and if you look at the uh, lipids, uh, LDL cholesterol here, in those who have high polygenic score versus not, you can see there's a slight increase uh, among those who have high polygenic score, higher, slightly higher LDL, but not, not um, clinically noticeable. So this is not really the, the major mechanism. So um, it, it really looks like it's a truly an additive effect of many, many things a uh, gamish of multiple things that is leading to these individuals having higher risk. Now, uh, uh, several questions that have, that have come up in this work over the last couple of years in terms of polygenic score, I'm going to address those in turn over the next few minutes. First is, what about the incremental value of this information, this genetic score, on top of traditional risk factors? So this is some unpublished work uh, in collaboration with uh, Mariu Orho Melander and Ola Melander in the Malmo Diet and Cancer Study. This is a prospective cohort study in, recruited between 1991 and 1996 uh, in Malmo, Sweden, about 25,000 people. They've been followed for 25 years, and about 4,000 developed incident coronary events during that time period. So here's an analysis, a multivariable model that included um, all the traditional risk factors, smoking, diabetes, and so family history of MI, so forth, the lipid risk factors here, not LDL and HDL, but rather ApoB and ApoA1, which are the constituent proteins on those lipoproteins. And then PRS here is the polygenic risk score. And given in standard per standard deviation um, uh, increment in terms of hazard uh, uh, for the quantitative traits. So what you can see here is, first of all, all of these variables are highly significant in this multivariable model in terms of prediction. So this is, the polygenic score is, adds incremental information beyond what's already measured. And then if you look at the, in comparative terms, um, the best understood risk factor, I would say, for coronary diseases is LDL or ApoB. And you can see per standard deviation change in ApoB, it's about a 1.3 fold increased risk uh, hazard, whereas for PRS is like 1.4. So it's basically equivalent in magnitude in terms of risk conferred per standard deviation change in, in that risk factor. So, and this is in, in, in addition to a very uh, often used a proxy for genetics, which is the family history. You can see family history here is important. It is, uh, gives you a uh, hazard and highly significant, but the, the genetic score adds on top of that. So, so this is, I think, um, uh, the, the latest on kind of thinking through the, the incremental value on top of traditional risk factors. And this is just a graphical representation of that. On the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is the cumulative event rate. And this is a group of individuals who've been stratified as intermediate risk based on the current algorithm used in the US to predict risk which, using clinical risk factors. That's called the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association risk equation. And these are all intermediate risk individuals according to this equation. And then you can see if you stratify them further based on polygenic risk that there's actually a separation among the individuals. Now, so that's uh, incremental value on top of risk factors. The second question that comes up is, does the polygenic background modify the penetrance of those uh, monogenic mutations that I, that I mentioned earlier? 
Um, and so if you think about the uh, monogenic mutations in LDR receptor or APOB or PCSK9, um, and this is now analysis in about 50K individuals from UK Biobank with exome and array data, and you can see that basically uh, the carriers of these monogenic mutations on average have, in this case, about five-fold increased risk for MI compared to non-carriers. But then if you overlay on top of that the percentile of polygenic score on the x-axis here now, and then the odds ratio, you can see that among non-carriers, this is 1% bins of polygenic score, there's actually a splay, and then there's a market step up based on, for monogenic carriers, but even among monogenic carriers, the polygenic background has a big role. So the average here of 5.64 for a monogenic can be separated out into more closer to 20 or so, if you're high polygenic and uh, have it on a carrier, versus low polygenic and a carrier um, of a monogenic mutation, you, you're approaching that of a non-carrier. So the, the polygenic background, the, the score, has a powerful impact uh, on the penetrance of this monogenic uh, mutation. And we've looked at this for other diseases as well, for breast cancer, for colon cancer, and it's the same story each time. Basically, the, the polygenic score modifies powerfully uh, the penetrance of the, uh, of the monogenic mutation. The third question that comes up is, is the polygenic risk modifiable? Uh, and so the answer here is yes. We've shown that adherence to a favorable lifestyle can cut the risk conferred by polygenicity, as well as uh, medicines like statin medications can actually lower uh, the risk. Uh, this is data from a randomized, three randomized controlled trials of statin therapy, where we looked at the efficacy of a treatment uh, by um, polygenic score, and those who are high polygenic score have greater benefit from statin therapy compared to, um, to uh, uh, low, low polygenic score. So right now, this is the risk, heart attack risk assessment, a number of uh, what are called traditional risk factors. And I think in a few years, uh, polygenic score will routinely be integrated into this, uh, given that it's incremental value uh, and that the, there's actually intervention uh, medications that could be given to modify the risk. So uh, that's mo monogenic and polygenic. What about the somatic model? Here, we're turning away from hereditary or germline variants to now acquired uh, or somatic mutations. And we typically think about somatic mutations in the context of cancer, uh, but uh, they, they seem to actually have a role in non-cancer diseases as well. And so uh, this is a, 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 a cartoon of the process. So this is hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, a stem cell may acquire a mutation and as a result uh, have a growth advantage and that clone can expand and that clone can acquire additional mutations. This whole process is called clonal hematopoiesis. A few years ago, Sid Jaswal and Van Ebert uh, described this process you, uh, based on exome sequences, blood exome sequences, and showed that it was highly age dependent. So by the time people are in their 80s or 90s, uh, roughly 10% of the population uh, in that age group has a dominant clone. We uh, went on to show a couple of years ago that patients with early heart attacks, surprisingly, actually had clones. These are young patients. They really shouldn't have any clones, but they do, and it confers roughly a three to four-fold increased risk for MI. So this clonal hematopoiesis seems to be a, 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 a player in terms of early MI risk. Um, what's the mechanism here? Um, well, here uh, there's some answers, largely from uh, animal models, that the mechanism seems to be excess inflammation. So um, having a clonal mutation basically uh, increases uh, uh, this inflammasome pathway uh, and that subsequently leads to atherosclerosis, at least in mouse models. So um, why do some people get clones at a young age? Um, what's the reason for this uh, somatic mutation process? So one hypothesis there, of course, would, might be germline genetic determinants of somatic mutations. And uh, we've looked at this now, uh, and others have looked at this before, uh, 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 the DECODE group with Kari, um, and, and actually 23andMe as well, uh, but we had access to roughly 100,000 whole genome sequences uh, from the TopMed study, uh, and, we're, and so where now you can simultaneously evaluate for uh, clonal hematopoiesis from the coding sequence data, and then also do a GWAS based on the common variants across the genome. And so before, uh, so we did that, and, and the first step is of course to show that uh, you, can, you can call uh, clonal hematopoiesis from kind of 20, 30x uh, WGS data, uh, and we were able to, and, and, and this has a very nice, uh, on the x-axis your age of blood draw, on the y-axis is 
um, uh, the estimated uh, chip prevalence. Um, and across all these different studies, there's a very consistent age-dependent relationship uh, for, uh, for CHIP, or clone hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, that's the abbreviation. Now, the clones uh, predominantly fall in just two genes, DNMT3A and TET2. Uh, more than 80% of the individuals uh, have clonal mutations just in these two genes. Um, and so we did a, an analysis uh, of uh, labeling carriers of uh, clonal hematopoiesis as cases and everybody else's controls and did a, a, a standard a genome-wide association study and here's the result. And there are uh, roughly uh, three loci that emerge. Um, this TERT locus was one previously identified by, by both DECODE and, uh, and, and, um, and 23andMe. And then these two emerge as, as new loci. And this TET2 is quite interesting because I just mentioned that TET2 is the gene that's mutated in clonal hematopoiesis and looks like there's, there's very comp genetic, standing genetic variation, germline genetic variation in the TET2 locus that influences the development of TET2 clonal hematopoiesis. So we delved into this a little further and it turns out that the, the lead variant or the key variant, what we think is the causal variant, is actually African ancestry specific. 3% variant non-coding in, in African ancestry individuals, really absent in the rest of the world. And this variant sits in a, um, an enhancer, uh, enhancer specific to hematopoietic stem cells. And um, in, in uh, Lucifer's assays, uh, the risk allele basically leads to dramatic uh, decrease in the expression of TET2. Uh, and so the model, working model right now is less germline, uh, this germline variant leads to less TET2. Uh, that leads to basically increased self-renewal of hematopoietic stem cells, giving rise the possibility of somatic mutations, basically. And there's a couple of other uh, lines of evidence to suggest that this self-renewal capacity of hematopoietic stem cells is a key driver of the somatic mutation process. Okay, so... Uh, let me close the risk part by just uh, coming to this model of common complex disease. And this was uh, work uh, built off of work uh, uh, um, uh, of others, uh, including Mark McCarthy, and thinking about uh, common complex disease in terms of a model. Is it a, uh, a model like a so-called a, a fruit salad model where in, an e in each individual you have a single driver, a single causal pathway? And you often hear this model in, 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 in terms like, well, diabetes is really 20 different diseases, only if we could resolve it into uh, a, you know, a different disease in each person with, 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 with additional measurements. So that, I think that's what, this is the, supposed to capture that concept. The other uh, option, of course, is in each person, there's still the same drivers, these, these colors, driving pathways, but in any given person, it's actually a quantitative blend of those drivers and uh, with relative uh, differences between people. Um, a little more, you know, strawberry here, a little more banana there. And uh, it's pretty clear, at least for coronary disease, that this is the model, that it's really a smoothie model, that there's a set of driving pathways, and in any given person, it's a quantitative blend. It's not all or none in any given person. But this is, I guess, literally food for thought for you. Um, Okay, so let's, let me close with the resistance part. Um, and here, uh, the best understood resistance pathway for MI is low LDL. So individuals who carry mutations that lower LDL lifelong in any of several genes, and here's just two of them, dramatically lower risk of heart attack. And uh, therapies have been developed to mimic these mutations, uh, specifically PCS kind of antibodies for this gene and then uh, as etamide, uh, oral, oral small molecule um, for uh, NPC101. Now, uh, it, 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 another uh, proposed pathway for protection for resistance is HDL. Um, and based on the observational epidemiology of higher HDL being correlated with lower risk of MI. But surprisingly, we found, and others have found, that HDL raising variants that naturally raise HDL lifelong actually had no effect on myocardial infarction suggesting that HDL may not actually be a causal factor, but rather a biomarker of risk, and would lead to a prediction that, uh, that basically medicines specifically designed just to raise HDL cholesterol would actually not work in terms of uh, clinical practice and, and clinical trials. And that's what actually was observed in several clinical trials now, uh, most notably um, uh, from Roche, uh, dalcetribib, uh, which raised HDL by about 40%, um, and uh, in a 14,000-person trial, 
uh, had no effect on coronary events uh, during, the, uh, during the observation period uh, in the RCT. So this really, uh, I think the, the pharmacologic data and the genetic data are consistent in, 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 in leading to the conclusion that, um, that HDL is a biomarker of risk, not necessarily a, a causal driver of risk or, or protection. And um, uh, so that leads to uh, the question of, well, what's going on here? Why is HDL so robustly associated in every epidemiologic study with lower risk of coronary disease? It turns out low levels of HDL or high levels of HDL track with, with triglycerides in the inverse direction. So if you have high HDL, you usually have low triglycerides and vice versa. And so we wondered whether it's actually the triglycerides that might be really important here. And there are several genes in the triglyceride rich lipoprotein pathway, ANGPTL3, APOC3, ANGPTL4, that we and others have shown have null mutations. Individuals who carry these null mutations in heterozygous form have lower risk of MI, lower lipid levels, uh, lower triglycerides. Um, and then for several of these genes, there are homozygous nulls, uh, and those individuals are, uh, are, are alive and well, uh, really raising the possibility that medicines uh, could and should be developed against these uh, these targets, uh, mimicking the mutations, and thereby these medicines might have uh, increased probability of success in terms of um, uh, in the clinic for lowering not just lipids, but also heart attack risk. And that's what's happening right now. There are medicines being developed to mimic these resistance mutations, all these uh, in, the, in, this, in this lipolysis or triglyceride-rich lipoprotein pathway. Here are the genes, uh, the heterozygous null frequency, the blood biomarker that's lowered, uh, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Uh, this is the risk. Um, uh, that in terms of lowering of risk based on the null mutation carriers, and then the medicines develop. And for these two genes, there's, there's ASOs, SIRNAs, and monoclonal antibodies in development, and then for ANGPTL4, uh, just monoclonal antibodies. So um, these genes, uh, ANGPTL3, ANGPTL4, and uh, APOC3, uh, emerge from kind of more or less unbiased studies of protection, looking for protective genes, but they um, all fall on uh, one pathway, which is the, the body's ability to clear dietary fat. Um, and so these normally put a break on your body's ability to clear dietary fat, and actually losing these breaks uh, enhances the body's ability to clear uh, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins uh, in terms of lipolysis. So um, just two more slides. Um, so uh, what I wanted to convey to you is for one disease, uh, using human genetics over the last uh, 10, 15 years to think through risk mutations and, and really they're useful to identify those likely um, to benefit from early intervention. Uh, and then protect, protection uh, really points us to protective variants, point, point us to causal pathways and, and new medicines. Um, uh, where do we go from here? Um, you know, on the risk side, I think it's going to be important for coronary disease to interpret genome early in life to identify individuals at risk for premature MI deliver uh, proven risk-reducing interventions uh, to those individuals. And then um, there's a, a lot of opportunity, I think, in understanding um, non-lipid pathways, and there are uh, several that have emerged, and, and also develop new treatments based on these insights. And so, uh, you know, kind of the treatment um, approach uh, or the, the possibility there is what I've um, kind of uh, moved to, uh, and really uh, I was motivated to kind of uh, to begin this new company um, based on this uh, possibility. So imagine if there was a, a one-time therapeutic, one-time uh, treatment uh, that would safely and permanently lower uh, ApoB-containing lipoproteins. That's uh, LPLA, LDL, and triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. And, and the human genetics really suggests that lifelong low levels of LDL uh, and triglycerides, uh, if you had that, uh, basically would be very hard to get a heart attack. Uh, and so the, this, this is a, a now possible, potentially, uh, if you can develop a, a therapy, a gene editing treatment, for example, that would safely edit the adult human genome to confer enduring protection against MI, and that's really the goal of, goal of uh, Verve Therapeutics. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jake. Uh, next up is Melina Klausnitzer from the Brode.
So thank you so much for the invite um, to talk about our efforts to convert variants to functions in the context of metabolic phenotypes. And I thought today, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you a high-level overview of two of our projects that we are kind of excited about. One is um, a deep dive, a single locus dissection study, and the other is an ongoing preliminary project in which we use polygenic risk scores to learn about disease etiology of insulin resistance using adipocytes as a model system. So that's why we are all here. I, I don't have to go into details. We've heard a lot. Um, GVAS have been incredibly successful. have identified many hundreds of um, associated loci with obesity-related, type 2 diabetes-related traits, and thousands of other traits. However, converting these maps to functions, that's really um, a bottleneck right now and much more challenging than we had hoped for 10 years ago. So in our work on the strongest genetic association with obesity, we have defined five key questions to include when converting variants to function. And that is, which of the associated variants actually plays causal roles? How do they affect upstream regulator binding, downstream target gene expression? In which cell types and conditions do they act? And what cellular and organismal processes are affected? Um, and there's one additional layer, as we have heard from Ben, Nancy, Mark, um, etc. the majority of loci actually has pleiotropic effects. And that, um, I think, is a great opportunity in that we can use these multiple associations to inform priors of causal cell types and causal mechanisms. Um, and in that context, I'm going to talk in the next few slides about um, our work on connecting a pleiotropic non-coding regulatory variant to cellular functions that are relevant for adiposity-related uh, traits, type 2 diabetes, and uh, insulin resistance. Um, and this locus um, is located on chromosome 2, and it actually, from FIVAS, associates with decreased fat mass percentage and other adiposity-related traits and an increased risk for type 2 diabetes, um, insulin resistance, and an increased waist-to-hip ratio. So from Hilary Finon Kant's beautiful LD score regression framework, we do know that these traits are enriched, or the heritability of these traits are enriched for enhancer signatures in adipocytes. And indeed, when we cro um, examine chromatin state maps across 127 reference epigenomes, we do observe that the locus is spanned primarily by quiescent chromatin, except for actually adipocytes and their progenitors that um, show some enhancer signatures. So we asked, how is the locus actually affecting the chromatin landscape? And we assayed um, chromatin accessibility across the genome by ATAC-seq as well as K27 acetylation as an enhancer histone mark in um, adipocytes from a heterozygous individual. And we observed that haplotype 1 actually associates with around a two-fold increased um, open chromatin in K27 acetylation compared to haplotype 2 which tells us that the locus is actually shifting the dynamic balance between an active enhancer and a less inactive enhancer. So the next step was that we sought to prioritize the cause of variance that might, um, um, that might underlie this signal using um, orthogonal computational sequence-based approaches. Here that is PMCA, um, which looks for conservation of transcription factor binding site patterns within 120 base per region surrounding the, the um, respective SNP, and BASET, which is a deep convolutional neural net that we train on um, genome-wide chromatin accessibility data, which we assay in adipocytes um, across a diver diversity of cell stages to predict um, the regulatory activity of, of a SNP in adipocytes. And it turns out that there's uh, one particular variant that actually has very high scores for all my matrices um, we use, and uh, Olga will go um, 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 more into, into deep say later, which supports this. Um, um, the SNP as well, so, and the SNP is predicted to decrease chromatin accessibility in adipocytes. So to confirm directly that the haplotype specific effect that we observed on chromatin accessibility and enhancer activity is driven um, or mediated at least in part by this particular variant, we performed CRISPR genome editing to make isogenic changes in adipocytes. Um, and we observed that one of the predicted target genes, which is copula one is decreased. Um, dependent on an upstream regulator called POW2F2. And we further observed that the single nucleotide added reproducibly decreases adipocyte differentiation capacity as measured here by R at O. So what's copula one actually doing in adipocytes? There's um, very little known about copula one overall and nothing known about the role of copula one in adipocytes. Um, and we know through in silico analysis that copula one has a vast homology two domain which is critical for actin nucleation. 
And indeed, when we knock down couple of one in the deposites, we observe that there's a, a profound perturbation of the actin cytoskeleton remodeling in these cells. Um, and the actin remodeling actually is essential for processes in the deposites, including the differentiation capacity, as well as insulin responsiveness. And indeed, following knockdown, um, these adipocytes are no more capable to differentiate into metabolically active cells, and um, they are marked by a decreased insulin resistance as measured by radio-labeled insulin-stimulated glucose uptake and, and lipolysis rate. So what about um, recapitulating um, organismal, um, the, the, the phenotypes that we do observe in, in humans? We worked here with Marcelo Nobrega from the University of Chicago. And Marcelo's team generated CRISPR cobol one um, knockout models. Um, and the, um, his team finds that these mites are actually lean, have a lower uh, body fat mass percentage, and are glucose intolerant exactly as the GBAS have, um, um, would show us. So this is, was a very high level overview, um, um, a quick um, uh, wrap up of the data we have that link a genetic variant which associates with adiposity related traits, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, to um, cellular function that are relevant for these traits, presumably driven by um, a failure of the actin remodeling process in adipocytes. And my lab has gone through um, several of these single locus dissection studies in the past seven years. And we certainly learned our lesson. It takes, takes quite some time to connect a genetic variant on the one, um, on the one side to um, cellular phenotypes that are relevant for these traits by providing evidence at any given step of this framework, right? And for us, uh, GVAS dissection truly is a layer problem. Uh, you can imagine that any given association is driven by at least one variant that has an effect on uh, some gene or function in some cell type under some condition and, and will impact some kind of pathway. So for any given node in the net, there are many hypotheses to test the combinatorial space is large, and we are really interested in developing and thinking about strategies that might preempt and accelerate these dissection efforts. Um, and in that context, um, one part of my lab is working towards developing CRISPR-based high-throughput variant editing technologies um, to, to uh, generate ground truth data um, and, and adjust priors and, and um, you know, assign posterior probabilities. I will not talk about this part of, the, of our efforts now, but we'll talk about a very exciting um, ongoing pro project we have in collaboration with <coughs> Cecilia Lindgren and, and Carpenter, where we use natural genetic variation in order to connect uh, genetic variants on the one side with phenotypic signatures in adipocytes um, using transcriptomics, epigenomics, and high-dimensional image-based profiling. So, we have built, taking one step back in the past, um, a biobank of 521 individuals from which we do have subcutaneous adipose tissue and visceral adipose tissue. The visceral adipose tissue is a um, fat that is stored around the internal organs and has been implicated as an independent causal risk factor. Um, and we, from these um, tissues, we have developed a standardized pipeline to isolate adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells that are banked can be thawed up and then um, nicely differentiated in these adipocytes through lipid accumulate uh, with a progressive accumulation of lipids as you see on the right side. So in, in this um, sub-project here we are um, focusing on um, polygenic risk scores for insulin resistance and, and, and use uh, or profile the tail ends of the, of the score distribution um, in adipocytes um, to learn about cellular functions that, um, that might be relevant to insulin resistance. For this project, um, to define polygenic predictors, we have worked with Chema Makada and Josep Maca um, uh, from Jose Flores group. Um, and Chema basically constructed um, a polygenic risk score for HOMA IR, which is a proxy of insulin resistance, aggregating 1.9 million um, variants. And he tested these scores in the partners biobank in more than 6,500 individuals, as well as in our adipocyte biobank, and observes that there's a 2.7-fold increased risk when comparing the bottom first percentile with the um, top first percentile of the distribution. So we stratified our adipocyte cord exactly to, um, according to these polygenic risk scores, and um, to, to um, ascertain the effects of polygenic risk scores for insulin resistance on cellular functions, um, we, we um, modified the cell painting protocol from N. Carpenter's lab and established adipocyte profiler, which is a high content, five channel, um, high throughput imaging approach that allows for extraction of more than 3,200 rich quantitative features 
um, at the single cell level, which are relevant to both morphological signatures as well as adipocyte specific um, signatures. So, to a certain effect on, um, um, of um, genome-wide uh, genome polygenic scores, polygenic risk scores uh, for insulin resistance um, on cellular functions, we then um, took in, in this preliminary project eight individuals from the top and the bottom of the, of the score distribution, um, sent them into um, adipocyte differentiation and imaged them. And after data processing and accounting for technical covariates, we spun up our data um, here um, in this low dimensional layout. And we find that in the progenitor st uh, state of subcutaneous and visceral adipocytes, these progenitors are actually fairly similar. Um, and we can nicely observe the trajectory of differentiation that varies between the subcutaneous and visceral adipocytes once they are sent into differentiation. And what really struck us is that for any given cell stage, for any differ um, given um, day of differentiation except for the progenitors, we do find that these features cluster by poly um, polygenic risk score as highlighted here for day 14 of differentiation. Um, and um, the red individuals are basically the ones from the, from the top of the score distribution at a high polygenic risk, and the blue ones are the ones from the bottom of the score distribution with a low polygenic risk. So the grouping patterns that um, contrasted between the, the high and the low polygenic risk carriers um, def um, were, were defined by key features that are informative for cytoplasm texture and lipid content, which basically points to um, to a failure in, in um, lipid accumulation in these cells. And this could be driven by either of two processes, either adipocyte differentiation, which goes along with the progressive accumulation of, of lipids, or lipid metabolism itself. And I come back to that later in a second. Um, taking one step back now, these polygenic eff effects we observed were independent of extrinsic factors, such as plating density, as shown on the left side, but also on batch effect and, and, and other factors, but did depend on cell stage with um, the differentiated stages, day 14 being the one that, um, that um, showed the, um, the highest variability bet between the tail ends of the score distribution. And this we could even see in the original ground truth images, as you can see on the right side, these are visceral adipocytes at day 14 of differentiation that, um, um, from individuals that sit in the top, um, uh, in the t in the um, top of the score distribution for insulin resistance, and these cannot accumulate lipids, as opposed to individuals from the bottom of the score distribution that show these nice um, lipid accumulations, as shown here by green fluorescent staining by Budipi. So we are currently increasing sample size, obviously, and for now we have ascertained the effect, thanks to Thule and her colleagues of polygenic risk scores on marker gene expression using, using the GTEx V8 um, release. And we do find that um, there are particularly two marker genes that correlate with polygenic risk scores. This is acetyl-CoA um, carboxylase and ATP citrase lyase. Um, and these two genes are core, um, um, core enzymes in a process that is called de novo lipogenesis. And de novo lipogenesis converts uh, or promotes the conversion of um, carbohydrates, acetyl-K to um, fatty acids that are then stored in the form of lipids in the deposites. We do not find any, um, um, any other gene to be correlated with, the, uh, with these polygenic risk scores. We find that this is effect is specific for the visceral adipose tissue, um, has a depot specificity, so the effect is not visible in subcutaneous adipose tissue, and it is cell type specific. We um, tested several um, other well -powered, uh, equally well-powered data sets um, with around 400 individuals, and there was no signal whatsoever in other cell types. So these data suggest that individuals at the high, uh, at the top of the distribution for um, uh, um, polygenic risk score distribution for insulin resistance might have a decreased lipid accumulation in visceral adipocytes, um, possibly driven by um, a decreased de novo lipogenesis rate in these individuals. We are currently increasing the N, obviously, in validating this finding, integrating other data layers, and um, we find these results encouraging in that we could um, hopefully in the future test if these effects might um, propagate through the connecting roads of um, regulatory elements, enhancers, and pathways, um, and eventually um, converge on only a few pathways and genes that might be relevant. So I want to thank all of you, um, the organizers of this fantastic meeting that really is a dream, dream come true, um, my team, 
the funders and, col and our collaborators. Thank you very much. Do we get to ask questions? Um, questions at the end. We'll have okay. a discussion at the end. Hold your fire, Nancy. Half an hour. No, we were, I'm so excited. Okay. I've got questions as well. But, uh. Next up, uh, Olga Trenskaya from Princeton. Come. Don't be shy. Is this somebody's phone? I'm the Flatiron Institute of the Simons Foundation. Your phone? I'll keep it. Josh, there's a message from Josh Denny. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Going out? Once, going twice, there in the back. Oh, <laughs> all right. All right. Is it working? It will. All right. Uh, so, pleasure to be here. Thank you again uh, for the organizers. And of course, uh, I'm a huge believer in the importance of this effort. I will sort of uh, follow up on uh, both the previous talk, uh, uh, which was great, and uh, as well as Francis's slide talking about the non-coding variants, and really uh, hoping to really impress on uh, you guys the importance of looking beyond the coding. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean beyond the genes, I mean beyond the coding effects. Uh, so uh, I will focus on the neuronal disease variants, but uh, the methods that I'll talk about are actually quite general and really trying to start thinking about how do we explore this three billion wide letter space, as Eric mentioned earlier, uh, and assign an effect to it, uh, both biochemical, functional, and eventually clinical effect to these variants, given that many of those variants are actually very rare uh, and we would not observe in sufficient enough statistical sample sizes in the populations. So what does that mean? That means that uh, for each of those three billion letters, uh, we need to really think about how each of the changes affects gene regulation. And by that I mean uh, at the biochemical level, fundamentally, things like how does this particular A to C change in that given location affect the binding of each transcription factor that might bind there? How does it affect various histone marks? How does it affect chromatin accessibility? And that's, of course, only the translational side of things, right? Post-translational, we start thinking about various RNA modifications, such as splicing, right, targeting, et cetera. Then, uh, of course, we need to go up from the biochemistry and start thinking about what it actually means functionally. Uh, and functionally, of course, that means how does it affect gene expression and post-transcriptional regulation of those genes. And of course, that has to be considered in specific cell type context, tissue context, that's what I'll focus on. But of course, in the long run, also general genomic context, environmental context, et cetera, as uh, previous speakers in my session have already pointed out. And that's all going to add a huge amount of complexity. And finally, of course, the last step is understanding what does it all mean for clinical disease. And of course, that's where we're all going, but I would argue that actually we can't just skip over all that I've built on because it's just not going to be tractable to be able to make cohorts big enough to be able to, for each one of the three billion letters in each of the various combinations in each of the genomic, <laughs> environmental, et cetera, context, ever be able to find the phenotype association for every possible phenotype and clinical variable, right? So uh, I will talk about some of the ways that we're thinking about this and then uh, hopefully give you some ideas uh, for ICDA, what I think we should be thinking about in the future. Uh, we think about it, uh, of course, in ways that are complementary uh, to quantitative genetics uh, approaches, which I think are critical, as well as to the functional genomic approaches like the ones just described that are equally critical. And I think it will take the whole combination of things, I think this is a theme emerging, uh, combination of experimental, clinical, quantitative genetic, uh, to be able to really uh, address the goal that ICDA is putting forth. Uh, so our methods uh, to start addressing these regulatory effects uh, are deep C and sequeer. These are deep learning methods that really try to learn the rules of how the genome uh, controls all of this biochemical gene regulation, uh, and it, they try to learn it in deep C's case for the transcriptional regulatory effect variant prediction, and in the C. cleaver's case uh, for the post transcription in fact, uh, RNA binding protein effects. Uh, and then going beyond that and predicting the functional effects of this, we have expecto that really builds on the 
uh, deep sea model to be and leverages actually the uh, GTEx data. So I'm uh, joining in the chorus of uh, thanks to the GTEx consortium uh, in being able to predict tissue specific and cell type specific gene expression purely from sequence. Um, and finally, I do want us to not forget, uh, and I think this has also been raised before, that these variants aren't playing the role in isolation, and in fact, genes largely uh, are not even playing the role in isolation in disease, so we really do need to think about multigenic and network effects uh, in human disease. I won't have time to really tell you about methods, but I'll t show you our resource, Human Base, that provides, in addition to all the above impact predictions, also tissue-specific functional maps, cell-type specific functional maps, um, disease gene associations, all made from huge amounts of pretty much every public gene expression data set we can get our hands on, physical interaction data, et cetera, integrated in these uh, maps that, again, are complementary to quantitative genetics data and hopefully help us interpret uh, things like quantitative genetics, GWAS studies, uh, EQTL studies, et cetera. Uh, so hopefully I've already uh, pointed out why this is hard, why predicting non-coding effects of variants is hard, uh, and why we can't just do this by constantly only sequencing people and finding associated clinical uh, variants. There's no question we have to do this. That data is absolutely critical, but we're not going to get every variant purely by that. We need to actually be able to essentially come up with a regulatory code that's equivalent to what the genetic code has done for the coding variants, right? Where for each change in the genome, whether we've observed it in a study in a significant association to a particular phenotype or not, for each change of the genome, even if we've never ever seen it in an individual, we would be able to actually have a specific biochemical, functional, and disease effect prediction. Uh, we've built this system, uh, Deep Sea, uh, that's one of the um, early uh, ways to do this. Uh, it uses deep convolutional networks. I will not show the complicated deep uh, learning slides. Happy to tell you more about it, or you can read the paper. Sequiver is an equivalent uh, sort of system that predicts post-transcriptional effects, so effects of each uh, base change on RNA binding proteins, uh, so things like splicing. What I really want to emphasize here is not so much how they work, but the fact that they really our attempts at learning the architecture of the genome, right? So the rules how this regulatory code works, and once you learn them, then you can predict an effect of any variant of the three billion available variants. And of course, the only way they can learn is by the availability of the functional genomic data. So I have to really emphasize this is not some magical deep learning thing that just creates life. Uh, this is really based on the uh, availability of in, in the case, for example, of deep C of ENCODE and uh, uh, roadmap epigenomics data, and you know, now bigger and bigger approaches like Systrom uh, maps, and in the case of uh, Sequiver in vivo RNA protein binding data. So if you can use these data and you never use mutational variant information, now you can predict an effect of every variant even if you've never ever seen it before in any cohort. So that means that now if you give it a variant, right, a mutation of, in this case, uh, I believe A to C change, shown here, then it's going to for thousands of different specific effects, specific transcription factor binding, uh, specific histone marks, et cetera, predict the likelihood that that variant will have an effect and how much. So in this case, for example, that variant in the case of A in that position is going to bind an important transcription factor and in C, for example, that binding is affected and the transcription factor no longer binds as effectively, so you might predict that this may be underlying a kid's predisposition to autism. This has been evaluated quite uh, successfully and used in a number of studies. Um, I want to tell you a, uh, a little vignette about how we've used it uh, for showing non-coding variant effect in a complex human disease in de novo uh, variant space for the first time. This is in autism uh, in whole genome sequencing data from the Simon Simplex collection cohort. Uh, so one of the things that I really want to Emphasize here is, of course, that cohorts are not all created the same, and we can't always do this, but in this case, actually, a lot of the power of this cohort comes from the fact that there was uh, both parents sequenced, which, of course, is important for de novo, but for regulatory variant detection for control, it was very nice because there's a, a proband and an unaffected sibling sequenced in each family. So we have a very strict control here. Um, and, of course, in autism, people have been looking for where the lost heritability is. If you're most generous, you would potentially argue that maybe up to 30% of heritability can be explained by the colliding variants. Um, 
Unfortunately, even as recently as uh, last December, um, here's a science paper from Sanders Lab, and basically, no matter how you slice and dice things, if you look either at all the non-coding all the non-coding variants, de novo variants there. Uh, in the little uh, cross, or if you overlay the non-coding variants by various cheap seek peaks or known transcription factor binding site, et cetera, you never can get statistical significance once you control for multiple hypothesis testing. So this is by the traditional way of looking at increased mutation burden by mutation count. Uh, we decided to use our approaches, deep C and seek we were, and asked this question instead of looking at the mutational burden in terms of mutation count, looking whether the probands had an increased mutation burden in terms of mutation impact, right? So is it just the count, or is it also that maybe those mutations are worse? Um, and it turns out when you do that, then both at the transcriptional and post-transcriptional level, you do see significance. The probands do indeed harbor mutations that are significantly more disease-like, right, than the mutations uh, harbored by their siblings, uh, and that differences actually increases once you start looking at, uh, for example, mutations around the start of genes or mutations around the start of uh, exec constrained genes. So these are evolutionary constrained genes that are more likely to be uh, disease associated. You can see that the picture is nearly identical for uh, mutations at the transcriptional and at the post-transcriptional end. You can actually obviously read all of this in the paper, but also you can look at all of these mutations and predictions of their effects uh, in our browser on human base. Uh, here I'm showing a specific mutation effect prediction. Uh, oh, there. A specific mutation effect prediction uh, where then we can actually look at what our prediction was for specific tissues and cell types, including all the GTEx tissue models. Uh, by the way, the difference is most significant in all the brain associated tissues, uh, uh, which is nice. Uh, but also then you can actually experimentally test it. So here are in vivo reporter <coughs> tests. Uh, for about 40 mutations that we tested, and you can see that, uh, well, you can't see, but I'll tell you, it's 94% of them actually do drive differential expression with that single base change from the sibling to the proband. Um, and in fact, about half, this was by chance, about half uh, increased the expression, about half decreased the expression. I was actually, I don't know, my predisposition was that I was expecting more decrease, but it turns out that it's not actually the case. This is obviously not a scientific observation on the fractions, but uh, it was interesting. So you can actually, obviously in this case, not verify necessarily that these are mutations driving these kids' autism diagnosis, but you can at least verify that the method is actually predicting absolutely correctly the biochemical and functional effects uh, of these mutations. And these are all neuronal genes. Some of them are actually known autism genes. Some of them hadn't had a clear autism association. So these are really nice candidates for further mouse model and kind of cohort studies. I also want to show you the other side, the post-transcriptional side. So here's a variant also in our browser. Uh, this is an RNA regulatory disruption effect prediction for SMEC1. Uh, SMEC1 is a very highly exact constrained gene. Uh, so clearly important, uh, it's a, basically a regulatory subunit of a ser serine threonine kinase. Uh, and in fact, indeed, we find that ASD proband specific reduction in the long isoform of SMEC1 in this case, just as predicted by Seek Weaver. Uh, just as a side note, this is all not just biochemistry. These things are linked, not just linking these mutations to potentially clinical association, but also overall, uh, linked to phenotypes, so we did actually find that low proband IQ is associated with higher dysregulation of, at the regulatory post-transcriptional level uh, in the probands, so in especially exact constrained genes. Now, if we want to build on top of it, what DeepC really does is it's basically a computational cheap seek, right? And it builds in power, of course, again, I want to emphasize this is not instead of the functional genomic experiments. It's basically leveraging all the enormous uh, efforts such as of the ENCODE and Robomet Epigenomic Consortium, but as these consortia generate more data, then we can build these computational models with more and more power for tissue and cell type specific prediction uh, of basically these biochemical chromatin effects. So that what means that you can actually start now taking sequence around the transcription si start site of every gene in the genome and be able to computationally predict what the chromatin would look like if you did cheap seek in that particular cell type. And that means now you can take this computational in silico cheap seq data, 
and train a classifier. We just trained the most basic classifier, that's all that regularized linear model says here, but you can train a machine learning model using expression data, right? So we use the GTAGS data, again, uh, for 218 tissues. And that means that now you completely have the directionality of causality going from sequence to expression, right? We can't really go backwards here because the models predicted the cheap seq data purely based on sequence. And you can start predicting expression completely from sequence. Granted, obvious thing that's glaringly abs absent here is environment, right? But it does predict expression correlation to whole chromosome holdouts, even if you control very carefully for any upstream binding site similarity, et cetera, uh, with over 0.8 correlation. So those of you who do expression analysis, you know, this is, I was very impressed, I was very happy, but it's not even close to, for example, two patients are probably 0 0.94, 0 0.95 uh, correlation. And that's not surprising because some of it is probably the models are nowhere near perfect yet. Some of it is obviously the environment isn't there, but that means that purely based on sequence, you can start understanding tissue specificity of expression, and that does actually, is actually quite successful at picking up uh, all of the common AQTLs when we looked at the largest studies across different tissues. Uh, and furthermore, it doesn't have the problem of being able to uh, look at rare variants, right? So it's very complementary to quantitative genetics. You can use it to uh, look at LD blocks in GWAS association studies and identify functional variants. Here we're just showing that the actual variant that Expecto selects is the one driving expression difference. And again, you can look at all of these predictions in human base. I'll skip this. I just want to finish just with the fact that we do need to start looking more carefully at network effects of those and really sort of combining the network fields that pe where people have been thinking about networks for a long time with sort of the more variant to function field where we have been thinking more genome to function. Um, and so here I'm just showing you uh, the uh, GWAS catalog genes for um, AD uh, and basically looking at the fact that there's clear functional modules here including, uh, including modules that are responsible for amyloid function regulation, neuronal development, et cetera. And you can actually zero into these uh, amyloid function module with specific genes like APOE and look at their function more directly in the network context for specific tissues on human base. Uh, but we need to really start thinking about how that links to variants. So what does that mean? So first, I'm really hoping that uh, not just my talk, but uh, at, uh, the other talks in my and other sessions have really convinced you that it is important to look not just in the coding variants, of course the most functional in the short term are coding variants, but we need to start thinking about transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulatory effects. They really do play a role in human disease. Sometimes they're actually immediately functional if you can link it to a gene where the coding variant is well understood and actionable. Uh, understanding these effects, it's really important and we need to understand them at the biochemical, functional and clinical level. Uh, and it's important to make these data and predictions accessible and truly accessible, right? So. I do think we, we just need, yes, there's things that we can do half measures to make people feel better, but if we really want to make a difference, we need to think about it. And this is both for the methods people like me and for the data generation people. Um, and so to progress, I would argue that we need whole genome data availability. I mean, obviously with the controls for patient confidentiality, et cetera, but not just summary statistics. It's important, but actually truly genome data availability. Um, ideally when possible with controls and certainly with annotations. Uh, I, again, want to join the chorus of saying that UK Biobank is really revolutionizing what data availability means. I know they have whole genomes coming. Uh, Simon Simplex collection is another example. And when you look at how much those fields progress and how many papers are spurred by this, we really need to figure out how to do this more regularly. Uh, we need quantitative genetics clinical data, but we also need tissue culture organoid models, ideally somehow associated with this, and actually relevant model organism data that hasn't gone away. Um, we need functional omics data generation. I completely agree with several others who have mentioned this. Um, and we need to do this across more cell types and tissues and eventually environments, et cetera. Um, we do need to deal with all of this. Obviously, we need more algorithms and methods. And, they're broadly in the variant to function space, but also for things like how do you combine model organism models with human data? How do you combine organoid data, right, et cetera? Um, and they need to also start thinking, and this is relying on data as well, 
how to put things in more context. And by context, I mean organismal context, population genetics, whole genome, environmental, genetic, et cetera. And finally, all of these data and methods should be shared with minimum barriers. Thank you, sorry, before Mark kicks me out. Okay, and last, um, we've got Judy Cho from Mount Sinai, and then we'll have some time for discussion. Hopefully. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for asking me to speak in this diseases subsection. Uh, two topics I'll cover is inflammatory bowel disease. Um, I'll show you some uh, single cell data that we have uh, from a recent publication. And the second part of the talk will cover biobanks and specifically what we're doing with the biobank at Mount Sinai called Biome. So in terms of IBD, uh, the diseases subgroup that I've been co-chairing with Mark McCarthy, uh, one of our charges was disease stratification. And so I'll show you a couple of data slides about the heterogeneity uh, of anti-TNF treatment response in ileal Crohn's disease. Um, and I'll close the IBD section by talking about examples of expected and unexpected pleiotropy. Um, and so this work that was published in Cell last month represented a wonderful multidisciplinary collaboration between Effie Kennigsberg, uh, an expert in single cell analysis, my group, um, expertise in gastroenterology and genetics, uh, and the immunology group uh, led by Miriam Murad and uh, Jerome Martin. And what we did in this paper was using single cell analyses of surgically resected tissue, we identified modules that correlated with resistance to anti-TNF uh, treatment. Um, and so what we did was we started with single cell analysis focused on tissues that we had an abundant source of, so the time of ileal resection. Um, and we took 11 patients, 22 samples. So when the surgeon resects out the inflamed terminal ileum, um, there is a cuff of normal tissue at the edge. And so we were sampling both inflamed and uninflamed tissues from 11 patients representing 22 samples, collecting both blood and tissue at the same time. And so Effie did the single cell clustering, identifying, uh, again, a, a huge amount of effort in terms of correcting for batch effects, uh, which can affect cluster identification, to ultimately the final tissue-based model identify 47 clusters divided between, in the tissue base, between inflamed and uninflamed cells. Now these 47 clusters were defined upon immediately recognizable large cell subtypes, such as T cells, which are by far the most abundant cells that we saw in, in the terminal ileum. But in addition, we saw less abundant cells, including inflammatory and mononuclear phagocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, um, as well as stromal cells. So then the next analysis was to then, given these clustering that we're getting on the single cell level, can we, again, what really dropped out quite dramatically in the initial PC analysis of simply estimating the fractions of cell clusters um, in these 22 different samples from 11 patients, by PC analysis, it was obvious that they immediately distributed in two major subgroups by the blue as well as the green subtypes. So in this designation, each arrow represents a single patient. The base of the arrow represents the PC analysis from the cell clusters from the uninflamed tissues, and the arrowhead represents the inflamed tissues. And you, when you drill the, these two dimensions, which accounts for 80% of the variability in cell cluster frequencies, we then focus then on the big differences that we saw within the inflamed tissues. Um, and when you do a correlation heat map and try to define what are the cell subtypes that are driving uh, this distinction, uh, we define a GMATS model, which stands for IgG producing plasma cells, inflammatory mononuclear phagocytes, highly activated T cells, as well as activated stromal cells. Now, um, a key part also, so in dividing these between the blue GMATS high and the green GMATS low cell um, patient subtypes, 
We, when you then look at the, compare the blood to the tissue, so we're at, on this, on this uh, bottom slide, we're comparing the y-axis, um, the uh, fractions in the blood, the x-axis and the fraction um, in, the, in, uh, the, in the intestine. And you can see that the GMAT high group, the treatment, what we initially show as the treatment resistant group, is characterized by having relatively low amounts of CD14 in the blood. It's because they're all going to the tissue. And so this is all consistent with a model of treatment refractory Crohn's disease, where front and center in the model is first the inflammatory ma uh, macrophages within the tissue, which we think substantially drives disease pathogenesis. This inflammatory macrophage drives a number of the most common pro-inflammatory mediators that are characterized by Crohn's disease, such as TNF, IL-23, OSM, um, as well as the, the major biomarker for Crohn's, which is fecal calprotectin. And so the crosstalk from these pro-inflammatory mediators going to the fibroblasts, the fibroblasts contain receptors for many of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And what happens often is that the fibroblasts can secrete uh, important chemokines that drive the blood, the, the, the leukocytes back to the tissues, including predominantly CCL2, which then results in the recruitment of more monocytes to the tissue. So this vicious cycle of a pro-inflammatory response, which can't be turned off, uh, it characterizes an anti-TNF non-response. One of the major genetic mysteries of Crohn's disease um, is why it's one, it doesn't have a major MHC association. Um, and two, uh, if you compare the, the largest effect loci um, in European ancestry Crohn's compared to Far East Asian Crohn's, uh, the Far East Asian Crohn's, again, work from Carl Anderson's group has shown this, is that the TNFS of 15 locus exerts an enormous effect size on the overall genetic architecture for a Far East Asian Crohn's. And in contrast, European ancestry individuals contain a number of independent alleles in the IL-23R gene region, as well as a number of uh, pathway members along the IL-23 pathway. So again, the, the crosstalk uh, to a, a, a significant effect is that, that mediation of IL-23 from the inflammatory macrophages to a variety of different receptor cells, uh, including ILC3 cells, TH17 cells, uh, as well as CD8 or TC17 cells. And so again, you can do this mapping process of trying to understand genetic heterogeneity uh, between populations. Um, but a key factor, and when you look at, start looking at treatment efficacy, is to what extent can the inflammatory activated state of these cells uh, result in deactivation to non-activated fibroblasts or, or quiescent tissue resident macrophages. And so, again, the key components of this GMATS module that we've identified uh, centers around this macrophage fibroblast crosstalk. So then if you can take basically, uh, uh, one of the discussions we had yesterday was, you know, should we be doing single cell on everybody? There's kind of practical reasons why that's not feasible. Uh, but what you can do is you can take the molecular, the very specific molecular and cellular insight that's generated from the single cell analysis and the clustering and the identification of uh, patient stratification to develop a single quantitative score and project that molecular insight from single cell onto bulk RNA-seq data sets in larger cohorts where you have clinical outcomes of interest. And so we utilized the pediatric conception risk cohort, and we selected the genes that, that contributed to the single quantitative trait uh, into the GMATs high, into those genes, uh, genes that were most differentially expressed between GMATs high and GMATs low patients, as well as those genes that are most differentially expressed between the 47 clusters. And so the, the, the risk cohort contains hundreds of samples for which we have prospective clinical data, including anti-TNF response, and we're plotting on the y-axis each row that then represents a score, the quantitative scores for this gene list uh, in these uh, individual pediatric risk patients. Um, and when you then stratify this, uh, you can then stratify based upon a single quantitative trait from bulk RNA-seq. Uh, you can basically stratify by those and make a categorical cutoff. You can stratify by either being high GMATs or versus low GMATs. And you can see that we saw a significant difference. Uh, the high GMATs patients were more anti-TNF treatment non-responsive uh, non uh, compared to patients who had low GMAT scores. And finally, this represents a collaborative effort with the Pediatrics Consortium. I want to particularly give a shout out to uh, Super Kugathasin and Ted Denson. So the fundamental paradigm for the treatment of Crohn's disease is blockade of pro-inflammatory cytokines, whether that's TNF or IL-23. And when you look across, one of the things I think is very useful for ICDA is to really think 
kind of how can we, can we make more efficient this identification of candidate therapies across seemingly disparate traits. So it would surprise no one that the drugs that treat effectively Crohn's disease will also work for psoriasis and vice versa. Uh, but one of the uh, kind of surprises, and I think what genetics can actually do quite effectively, is identify unexpected cases of pleiotropy. Uh, and one example is what we reported here last year um, was with, with respect to uh, the gene LRRK2 or leucine retrepeat kinase 2. Now, at first blush, Crohn's disease seems completely unrelated to Parkinson's disease. One affects the gut, the other the brain. Uh, fundamentally, in terms of age of onset, the age of onset of Crohn's disease is um, teenage years and, and early adulthood. Parkinson's is a late onset disease. The rhythms of disease are different. In Crohn's disease, you often typically have episodic inflammation, whereas with Parkinson's, you have this progressive de uh, degeneration. But interestingly, in our exome chip analysis, uh, we identified, again, this was done by, led by Ken Hui, uh, when I, an MD-PhD student when I was at Yale, and then also Inga Peter at Mount Sinai, is you can identify within the same gene both risk and protective alleles. Uh, the risk allele was located within the kinase domain and is a gain of function kinase. The protective allele is located within the ROC domain and results in deactivation. Interestingly, the protective alleles are common between Crohn's disease and Parkinson's, and the risk alleles are unique. They have distinct uh, risk alleles uh, within the kinase domain, and one can speculate this is due to different kinase substrates. And again, the commonality between these two seemingly unrelated diseases or traits uh, is the key role for innate immunity, macrophages, microglial, even in neuro neurodegenerative diseases. Again, we discussed that multiple times yesterday with respect to Alzheimer's. So part two, biobanks, um, and so uh, I'll just make a couple of comments on biobanks. Uh, when you go to medical school, many of us were taught that when you hear ho horse uh, hoofbeats, uh, you should think horses and not zebras. The idea here is that common things are common. You shouldn't, when you try to generate, when you're presented with a patient with symptoms and you're trying to generate a differential diagnosis, uh, you should think of the most common causes of disease. And one example of this is congestive heart failure. So congestive heart failure functionally is a pump failure. It's a capacity to pump blood from the left ventricle throughout the body most effectively. And we think about the differential diagnosis for what may cause congestive heart failure. Uh, it can result perhaps from a plumbing problem. Okay, the blood is going backwards, regurgitation, going back even to the lung, resulting in shortness of breath. Uh, it can also be a resistance problem where maybe you have blockade of where the, the left ventricle, either in the aorta or most commonly through hypertension, right? And so it's often a, an imprecise diagnosis in clinical practice. A patient presents with a little bit of shortness of breath. They can't lie down flat without getting shorter breath. Um, but there are important zebras in the precision medicine era that we really need to start identifying, um, including one example of what's amyloid-associated transthyretin cardiomyopathy. You can have a pump failure in itself. Um, and the reason why it matters to make this diagnosis is that approved in May uh, was a, a specific agent, tafamidis, uh, which is a small molecule which stabilizes uh, transthyretin. And so uh, this was a wonderful collaborative effort uh, led by, in Sinai by Ron Doe, who's here in the audience, Garish Nadkarni and Kumar Chaudhuri. And again, this was an ex a great example of two biobanks working together to really make the whole much greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, so when Dan Rader was visiting Mount Sinai a bit ago, uh, he basically shared this idea with us that there is this amino acid polymorphism at codon 122 acts like a dominant to result in an increased risk for heart failure. Um, and the two groups got together very quickly, good communication between the two groups, transparent throughout the discussion, initially working independently and eventually joining forces led by Scott Damrauer uh, to identify between these two biobanks, okay, two different biobanks, both in Hispanics as well as African populations, we identified roughly the same odds ratio for prevalent heart failure uh, in patients carrying the V122I allele. And again, so it, it makes sense. This is part of one story, but then also when, I was, when Nancy was talking about how the Vanderbilt health system is actually much larger where you actually have the entire data system, Biome is presently constructed as about 1% of the entire Mount Sinai health system. And so the question is, with all the information that we've gleaned through this study, can we even think about developing predictive models in the larger cohort of 5 million patients uh, served by the Mount Sinai Health System?
So I'll conclude by talking a little bit about the uh, activities that we're doing uh, in BioMe. Uh, and so uh, we have whole exome sequence on a little over 30,000 patients, and again, led by Ruth Luce, as well as Steve Ellis. Uh, we're broadly sharing uh, the exome data throughout the school, and that's been happy to talk about that. We begun discussions about integrating the biobank uh, with other existing tissue biobanks, radiology, the warehouse. There's obviously big issues with respect to governance and regulatory issues. We've already begun a program, which I think should be an action item with an ICDA, of recall by genotypes, uh, looking at loss of function variants and developing uh, iPSC cells from them. And again, uh, Emer, Kenny, and Nora uh, Abu Hussein is, uh, are leading a center for genomic health. We're actually taking data, using good medical genetics to actually return results that are actionable in patients today. So in conclusion, um, when we start thinking systematically about what ICDA can do in this disease space, uh, obviously there are certain obvious things that we need to capture, such as demographic features, gender, population, and so forth. Uh, treatment must be a central part of this. When you start dealing with individuals that have complex history and multiple comorbidities, uh, it's not easy to do that. American healthcare um, is rather fragmented. Uh, in the single cell space, uh, there's obvious signals that you're going to see. In the fake case of IBD, one of the big signals that we saw were in TH17 cells. When we start trying to develop the key drivers that may be upstream of that adaptive immune response, rare cells may be particularly important, innate immunity, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells. And again, as a group, I think we need to think very thoughtfully about the shared mechanisms. You can see the same gene affecting an early onset versus a late onset disease. So the time course, the order of exposures, the magnitude of those exposures uh, are all important. And I think that some of the new uh, novel analytic approaches, including Mendelian randomization, can be insightful here. Um, so, in conclusion, I'd like to first thank my lab. Uh, it really is a privilege to lead a research group, and I think it's important for all of us to keep that in mind. Uh, it's also been my privilege to lead the NIDDK uh, Data Coordinating Center for the last 17 years. We just had a meeting uh, earlier this month in New York that was terrific that we tweeted about. Uh, not pictured here, I want to just shout out as John Rue and, and, and uh, German McGovern. You cannot run school-based biobanks and academic medical centers without enormous support from the school administration uh, that I'd like to thank, including the IBD group at, 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 uh, at Mount Sinai. And then finally, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Grossman for his interest in fibrosis and as well as neurodegeneration and the Bronfman team for really emphasizing patients, most of all. Thank you. So can I get Seik and Melina and Olga back up? We've got some time for discussion. Um, whilst people come to the microphones, from each of you, one thing that would allow you to take what you're learning in your disease, specific disease, and would be useful to other diseases, right? Not, not biobanks and things like that, which are generically useful, but one approach that you think you've developed that has potential for exploitation in other disease areas, starting with Judy. Um. It's on? Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I, I was just talking about this with Tim Barron. So, um, in I, IBD, a loss of function protective alleles in IL-23R, uh, blockade of that pathway works. So, I think we should just scale that. Human knockout project, essentially, yeah. 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 Um, adipocytes, um, apart from the biobank and profiling those, I think that perturbations through CRISPR at scale will be important to infer conclusions and will be helpful for the rest. Okay, Olga? Uh, I'm amplifying the uh, effect of these experimental functional genomic data with computational models that learn and generalize the variant effect predictions. Say. Uh, integrating uh, monogenic, polygenic, somatic mutation, and lifestyle factors into uh, risk models. Okay. Great. And over to Nancy gets the chance to ask a question, then Carrie. <laughs> this was a fantastic session. Uh, you guys did a great job, and it's really hard not to be excited about where, where this can all go. I, I guess, so I got inspired by Melina's talk and, and some of what SEC talked about. Is it time to really start a kind of a biobank of um, subjects chosen to be in the middle? plus and minus one standard deviation, and at the tails, 
of polygenic risk distributions for as many phenotypes as we can think about, also for the purpose of CRISPRing in rare variant mutations so that we know the polygenic backgrounds even as we do that. Seeing the opportunities that from the, the adipocytes and thinking about, you know, again, um, echoing some of Rory's comments, we don't have to be able to create all the cell types yet, differentiate everything from IPS yet to make this a valuable resource now and in the future when we're better at many different kinds of cell types. And I think having the, the full spectrum of polygenicity represented in banks for, for a lot of different phenotypes offers all kinds of opportunities to learn what polygenic liability is about in different kinds of cell models. But then with the rare variants of larger effects to see how they're acting on these known polygenic backgrounds across the full spectrum. Yeah. I think there, there could be a lot of Th thoughts. Fun. And I guess one question whether you just do it in 5,000 people and then you've got the tails of the polygenic score for everything. Nah, yeah. No, I'm talking about much further in those much polygenic further, right. yeah, okay. tails. Anybody want to comment? Yeah, no, I, th I think it, it is an open question in terms of um, going out to the very extreme um, of the tails and seeing those individuals and, um, and also having recall capabilities. I think yeah. that some of the cohorts have that, many don't, and I think having a uh, very large end so that you could go to the extreme tail and then having recall capability seems important. Yeah. Across you know, many of the resources that are already available, you could get pretty far out in the tail. Okay, yeah. good. Cody. Uh, Sir Kerr, I am really, really concerned about a couple of statements that you made. Number one, that it has been shown that somatic mutation contribute to um, myocardial infarction or coronary artery disease, basing it on clo clonal hematopoiesis, which is simply a clonal expansion of cells in the blood. So you are assuming that the mutational burden that you see in these clones indicate more mutations but it doesn't have to be so because there is just an in increase in, in clonal size. And secondly, we have looked very, very carefully at this, and there is no correlation between clonal hematopoiesis and coronary artery disease, none at all. We know, however, that smoking increases clonal hematopoiesis, and there are all kinds of things that you have to correct for before you jump to the conclusion that there's an association. This is number one. And number two, um, I remain concerned about your statement that triglycerides have anything to do with the pathogenesis of coronary artery disease. Triglycerides and remnant cholesterol are very co correlated. If you correct for remnant cholesterol, the effect of triglycerides dis disappear. All right? If you correct for triglycerides, the effect of remnant cholesterol remains. So everything indicates that the triglycerides do not basically participate in the pathogenesis. However, the targets that you described may actually be very good targets, but not because they lower uh, triglycerides, but because they potentially lower remnant cholesterol. So if it is true that they are good targets, it would be a beautiful example of the second law of classic logic that you can arrive at the right conclusion on the basis of wrong premises. That's all. I think that's one for you, let's say. Uh, yeah, so I completely agree with you on the second point. Um, I think if, uh, I usually refer to it as triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and those lipoproteins have two things in them, triglycerides and cholesterol. It's unclear which of those, or relatively unclear, which of the two components in the middle of those lipoproteins is actually the toxic component, and I think I agree with you. The best evidence is it's actually the cholesterol in the middle of those lipoproteins that it's, is it's bad for you. It's not just the best evidence, it's the only evidence, all right. I think others would disagree with you, but I mean, I, I agree with you. I think it is the, the best, best evidence supports cholesterol as the, as the toxic moiety. Um, but then the second point you made, which is this is one pathway that is involved in metabolizing the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and the specific genes, uh, NGPTL3, 4, and APOC3, 
they do seem to be good targets because they, they, they're protective in terms of how they're protective. Regarding the chip story, yes, I think that uh, right now it's very early, and I may have been a little uh, too dogmatic. All we have is an association between um, uh, clonal hematopoiesis and disease in... It doesn't replicate. We have done this thoroughly. We have done this carefully. Yeah, and there I is not an association. It'd be, yeah, it'd be great to see that data. I haven't seen that published. Yeah. And, and we, you know, we actually sent in a letter and, and tried to have it corrected, but the journals are funny when you try to correct mistakes, even though you present them with ironclad evidence. And, and remember, there are things that affect clonal hematopoiesis. Yeah, absolutely. You, that you, also affect the risk of coronary artery disease. I, I think it, it is a difficult situation because it's such an age-dependent phenomenon. And uh, you could, in some sense, have argued that it's simply a molecular marker of aging. Uh, and the residual association is confounding for other things that are not corrected for. Uh, but you have the association. You have a pretty good m model system data. Uh, for TET2 and a bunch of other genes. Um, so I think time will tell. Okay. Yeah, and we so should. I want to do five things. I want to get these four questions in, and I want to get to lunch. So first, Navi at the back. Uh, also a question for uh, Sec. Um, we briefly spoke about this when we hung out the other day. I was hoping you could share the perspective from your new perch for those here. Um, so you're one of the few speakers we've heard from who's working on a therapeutic, uh, and a genetically guided therapeutic. And for the M2, M2, M, the last 2M is, is to medicines. Um, and when we, we met, we discussed that if you were following that logical train of thought that genetics leads to good targets, APOB-driven atherosclerosis, however defined, seems like a very, very good place to start. Uh, yet, um, you've launched a startup company to, to do that. That's not something that's happening within the confines of typical kind of biopharma. I was wondering if you could comment on why did you need to start up a startup company uh, to do this? And, and then second, for the, the ICDA, could that be a specific success metric? Do you see mm -hmm. more companies like yours being enabled uh, by initiatives like the ICDA? I mean, the answer to the first question is very simple. It's, it's hard to get a $60 million NIH grant um, in terms of medicines <laughs> development. So, you know, medicines development is super expensive, as you know better than anybody. Um, typically cup, at least a couple hundred million dollars to get to the phase one proof of concept in humans uh, many times. So I think the scale it, and the commitment required just need, you know, it's, it's tough to do within academia. Um, yeah, I think that could be a reasonable output of a ICDA, that the idea that there are things coming out uh, from the work here that's stimulating new, uh, new enterprises. Uh, but I'm not sure that has to be the, necessarily the success okay. milestone. Okay, let's keep cracking. Carol? Yep. Carol Strada, Biomarine. So a question from Melina. I really enjoy your talk as usual. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, uh, so if we would want to go from just one gene, like what you did to say, we want to characterize every single gene that was in the GWAS meta-analysis, like what would, we knew, what, would we, what would be needed in order to get into that? Uh, stage and you know testing not only adipose cells but any other cell that is thought that it's relevant for, for that particular disease like how do we get there um, Carol was that gene based or variant based would you ask sorry well let's I didn't say get that you already have all the variants and you yeah. you know what the causal variant is and you want to go all the way forward to you know know the mechanism yeah yeah uh, Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so a lot is needed for that to go the full span, I think, starting from the genetic association down to, um, you know, a confident causal target that um, impacts some kind of pathway. So I think, as said before, these, and, and Nancy put that fantastically, this is exactly what I think we need. We do need biobanks that we can which, you know, challenge or where we de have developed um, model systems, cellular model systems where we can assess a lot of the natural genetic variation effect. And I think we have to add that up with um, perturbation-based screens on um, the gene level, the enhancer level, and the variant level to draw conclusive um, or, or to draw conclusions. Okay. But that takes time. <laughs> can I crack on Kathleen Baum? Yeah. Um, Fantastic session. I want to play on Nancy's point a little bit more, and this is for the panel, but maybe specifically Judy and Sake, given um, your clinical expertise. 
in the space of implementation, the clinical implementation of personalized medicine, what do we need to do as a community and how can ICDA facilitate this to move the needle such that PRS becomes a best practice in the clinical space? Like, what has to happen from here to get there? Practically speaking, I, I hate to say this, but I think it's true. You have to prove in the U.S., you have to pr prove clinical benefit. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find some early wins um, and say that, I mean, one of the concerns is that if you have more information, you're gonna have more testing, you're gonna jack up prices. And so I think we need to, as a community, identify a, a few key, you know, best case scenarios and prove that it benefits patients in the US. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think the, the, the standard of a, you know, randomized controlled trial to prove the clinical utility of a blood test seems pretty high, um, but that some people can hold that up like that. Um, but I think there, you get clinical adoption, at least let's say for the heart attack score, when you show to patients and clinicians that knowing this information can make a difference. And so, for example, um, we've been thinking about a, a study where you identify individuals who are solely abnormal on the polygenic risk for MI, not a lot of other abnormalities, wouldn't have been selected for treatment, for example, with a statin medication, and then you randomize them to statin versus no, and do a follow-up of a surrogate outcome, for example, like uh, amount of coronary uh, plaque on CT angiograms, uh, and you know that could be a one or two year trial where you could actually show some, um, some benefit um, uh, with, uh, with choosing people based on that abnormality. So I think that's the kind of study that might be needed to get kind of widespread adoption. The final point I'll make is that at Mount Sinai, we're focusing on primary care. This is Emer and, and Nora. Um, and you really don't want to overburden the primary care providers. You have to make it easy for them. Rory? Uh, Rory Collins, Oxford. So thanks very much for showing so much uh, unpublished data, which was really nice. But with respect to the um, statement about statins lowering the risk of uh, coronary events by 40%, among people with a high uh, genetic risk score uh, and actually having no effect oh, no. Uh, uh, among people with a low genetic risk score, which is the claim from the paper by Mega et al. Uh, and the, the, the follow-up paper. Um, despite the, LDL, the absolute LDL difference being pretty much the same irrespective of uh, the genetic risk score. Um, and all of the data from statins, from C, with uh, anisetropib, with PCSK9 inhibitors, indicate that the proportional or the relative risk reduction is associated with the absolute LDL reduction. What is the hypothesis whereby lowering LDL does not lower risk among people with a low genetic risk score, other than the fact that there's a p-value per trend of 0.03 in an exploratory analysis? The, uh, the, the, the statement should be that there is a 44% reduction in the high polygenic group, and in everybody else, the risk reduction was not zero, but in what we found was more like 25%. No, in, in the paper you presented, it's zero among those with low. There's a, there's a trend, it's a p-value of 0.03, and it's being interpreted as there's no benefit. And on the basis of that, uh, companies are thinking about doing trials of LDL lowering therapy only among people with a high genetic risk score on the assumption that there's no effect. And I mean, it's unclear what kind of hypothesis uh, would actually uh, support that. Yeah, I think there are two more additional analyses that are on, undergoing, uh, underway right now in the PCSK9 inhibitor trials that are looking at the same question of relative benefit of LDL lowering with PCSK9 inhibitors in both uh, the Fourier and the, um, and the uh, other trial for uh, alirocumab um, to see basically, you know, what is the trend there. We were limited by basically there are just three large-scale randomized controlled trials that had primary prevention data, and um, we looked at the relative benefit based on strata of polygenic score, and the results are what you see. So. I agree, we, we need to see more. Um, and hopefully the PCSK9 trial data, um, the secondary analysis there, will shed, shed some more light on 
whether there is a real effect or is, as you say, the play of chance. Okay. And then lastly, uh, Jesse. Oh, I, I, let me, can I do it, Jesse, and then I'll I, I you, I'm Karen. just going to inform him, if, on the PCS, on the four-year trial, you're not going to see what you are describing, all right? You're not going to, the polygenic score, he does not have any effect on the clinical outcome. It, okay, unpublished data. It's so I thought these were all really exciting examples of uh, finding disease mechanisms, of connecting maps to medicines, um, using, I think, some mm. new approaches. And I, I was wondering if you could comment on what aspects of the maps were really needed to make those possible. And as we envision applying those approaches much more systematically across new diseases or in new cohorts, what do you really need from the biobanks or the disease consortia to make it possible? Good. Can I start? A couple of answers. So, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I do. Um, I have a lot of responses or a lot of points to that. The one that we actually discussed with Antrul and Hillary over lunch yesterday is that we do need, um, in a given cellular system, epigenomic transcriptomic data for training deep convolutional neural net for variant prediction. Um, as Anshu will talk about that, I guess, because these models don't perform well if you don't have the right data at the right cell stages in the right context. Anybody else? Uh, so I'll second, uh, I'll, though I'll say also epigenomic, even more potentially importantly, but also transcriptomic and uh, other functional genomic data. Um, and then in the biobanks, I think whole genome data availability, uh, ideally at least if possible, controlled you know, if there is a situation where there is actually reasonable built-in controls, that would be amazing, like sibling controls, et cetera, uh, and as much as an annotations as possible. Obviously, you know, there's limits, but being able to actually discover, you know, things like metformin, I mean, this is obviously now much more obvious, but that metformin actually has something to do with AD, right? Being able to have that annotation is critical, right? So as much data as possible. I would add proteins. We just make this huge assumption yeah. that RNA equals proteins, and that's not correct. Definitely. Oh, I agree. Mm -hmm. And on the subject of needing protein, it's time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Very smooth. <laughs> so uh, let's thank the speakers again. And um, farmer, farmer colleagues, there's a little farmer corner over there. We're supposed to have farmer council at lunch. So any other farmer people can congregate over there. We can wander down to lunch together. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah.